Yes, um, Bill and I had gone to sleep that evening, uh, November 22nd, and we had come from a friend's home. It was a prayer meeting, a weekly prayer meeting we attended every Sunday night. Nothing unusual. Went to bed about 11.30 or so. And I awoke. I was in my bed, and it was 3.23 in the morning when I woke up. And I do know that because the first thing I did when I heard screams coming from our living room is I saw the digital clock uh, to my left, and I turned and I saw it was 3.23 in the morning. And I proceeded down our living room um, hallway, and I found my husband in a state that um, anyone who knows him would know this is, he's completely out of character. He was traumatized, holding his hands to his temple, and crying out in terror, saying, you know, pray for me, pray for me, the Lord has taken me to hell. So this is not like my husband's nature. He's a, as he says, he's conservative. Anyone who knows him, he's steady as he goes. That's his personality. And so I first, of course, was in shock. But at the same time, I had relief that he wasn't having a medical emergency. And I proceeded to pray. And thankfully, the Lord um, removed the terror from his mind after a time of praying. But he left the memory so Bill could share it with people. And... Um, one of the first things he asked for was a glass of water, and I got that for him, and then he, he calmed down and told me that evening what happened. And I'm going to let him um, take you on a journey right now. Thanks, Gorgeous. We went to a prayer meeting like we did every Sunday night, and we returned from the prayer meeting, went to bed like any other normal night, and at about at 3 o'clock in the morning, I knew it was 3 o'clock. For some reason, I can't explain to you why I knew it was 3, but... The Lord picked me up and took me out of my body and dropped me off in a prison cell in hell. And there was no explanation uh, at all until the return. And so uh, I found myself in a prison cell, just like you would imagine a prison cell to be, with rough hewn stone walls and um, bars on the doors. And uh, it was light for only about a minute, so I could see to describe to you what I saw. And then it resumed its normal state of darkness. But the first thing I noticed in this cell was the heat, the tremendous heat. I wondered immediately, why am I alive in this heat? It was way far beyond the ability for my body to live, but yet I was alive. And it was terrible, horrible heat. I don't know what the temperature was, but it was way beyond. I should have died. And I, I noticed that I, had, uh, I was lying on the floor and I had absolutely no strength in my body, completely void of any kind of strength. I could barely move. I, um, I looked up and I, I saw these two creatures in the cell. There were two of these creatures. Now, I didn't know what they were at first and because I went there as an unsaved person would be. The Lord withheld it from my mind that I was a Christian. He blocked it from my mind, which there's, there's lots of scriptures, but just to give you three, the Lord can do anything, but to give you a scriptural reference, uh, in 2 Kings 4.27 and Daniel 4.34 and uh, I think Luke 18.34 talks about where the Lord can hide something from someone's mind. And uh, I don't have time to go through each one. I'd love to go through the scriptures each one at a time with you because that's the important thing to believe. But we just don't have the time. But anyway, so uh, to give scriptural uh, basis for that. So he blocked it from my mind and explained to me why on the way back, which I'll get to in a minute. But... Uh, the, well, I'll just tell you. you know, the reason he blocked it from my mind, see, if I would have been there as a Christian, then I would have had hope. And I would have been able to cry out and say, you know, God's getting me out of here. Well, he wanted me to experience what they feel there. And that they're, now, they'll never get out. They're hopelessly lost and they'll never get out. You see, and that's what he wanted me to experience. So he blocked it from my mind. So I didn't know what these creatures were. I wasn't there as a Christian to observe, oh, that's a fallen angel or a demon. I didn't realize what they were. They were just enormous creatures. And um, I noticed you know, the size of this thing, first of all. And this might sound like a colorful exaggeration, but this, this one was about 13 feet tall. And to give you some scriptural basis for that again, in Genesis 6-4 it talks about uh, where the sons of God came and had relations with women. Well, most of the commentators believe that the sons of God refers to the fallen angels. So the fallen angels came down, had relations with women, and produced giants in the earth in those days. And uh, then in Deuteronomy 3.11 talks about the giant, one of his, his bedstead was made of iron and was nine cubits in length. Now a cubit is a foot and a half, so it's about 13 and a half feet long for the, the bedstead of the 
the giant. So the giants in the earth came as a result of fallen angels having relations with women. Okay, so fallen angels are in hell. There, that's what fallen angels or demons call them what you want. There may be some differences, but that's, that's too uh, technical to get into. But, um, so this creature was about 13 feet tall. Okay, so you can look on the wall. The pastor had it drawn on the wall. That's how big 13 feet is. So to give you an idea, bring it in a perspective. Uh, just gigantic thing. And it was all reptilish, scaly, uh, bumps all over its body. Really grotesque and horrifying, just horrifying to look at. We're going to see a video in a little bit. We put together a three-minute video, uh, Mary Kay Baxter and myself, uh, who was another lady that had experienced hell. And in the video, one of the uh, clips came from Kenneth Hagin giving his testimony to Joel Osteen's church. Uh, they did a video and he described the demon that he saw. Well, strangely enough, it was exactly like the one I saw. So I don't know how whoever drew it depicted it to be so exact, but this is exactly the one, one of the ones I saw in hell. So it's from Kenneth Hagin's testimony and that, that's where it came from. So I've been trying to show it to people to give them an tell, idea. Tell them what you told me, that when you first saw this, this video, it just blew you away. You, he said, I went back and forth and looked at it uh, 20, 30 times. I said, I told my wife, I, said, I can't believe that image on that video is the exact demon that I saw. And you said... Right, it was exactly. And it only shows him from about here up. I saw the whole body. So, you know, it, this doesn't show the whole body, but I just was amazed. I kept playing it back thinking, how in the world they get it so exact? I wanted to contact Kenneth Hagen, but, you know, I, I couldn't. So, uh, anyway, I don't know how they got it so exact, but this really is a good representation uh, of what they look like. Now, they're all different, all different sizes, shapes, or small ones, and so, which I'll talk about, but this particular one is huge, and it's ferocious. It's not just that it's big. It's ferocious, and it hates you, and it's powerful, and it was pacing in this cell like a caged bull, and let, ready to pounce and tear me to shreds. Okay, so if you can imagine the most wild beast animal you can picture, well, this is far worse than that. So with the size and with its uh, nature, uh, it was terrifying. I was just absolutely terrified. Yeah, so it's, um, its head, it's hard to tell, but its head is probably this wide. So it's just an enormous head with huge teeth. It had claws about a foot long. It's foot long claws on it. Uh, it was totally out of proportion, no symmetry to it. You know, one ear big, one ear small, one arm long, one arm short, one foot big, one small, no symmetry to the just deformed, twisted, uh, grotesque creature. And um, it paced around this cage uh, and just they, it was conversing with another demon in the cage. Uh, the other one looked different than this. The other one had razor sharp fins all over its body and was uh, thinner. This one was real stout and powerful looking, real wide like that picture on the wall, real wide like that and big. So you can imagine, look how small I am compared to that. Any of us would be small compared to that. But uh, that is a, that's what they look like. It, as far as uh, the, the stench from this thing was terrible. Absolutely the most foul, putrid smell you could ever imagine. But besides that, in hell, there's a smell of sulfur, burning sulfur, which you can't breathe. And, uh, you know, if you've been to Hawaii, which I haven't, but uh, they talk about if you go see the volcano, you can't go past a certain point because the, the fumes from the volcanic ash and so forth is uh, from the sulfur and it will kill you. It's toxic. Well, that's what you have to breathe in hell. It's toxic air. So you should die from breathing. And, but yet you keep living. And you don't want to breathe because you feel it's going to kill me. I'm going to die any second. But again, you keep on going. And besides that, there's not enough air to breathe. So you don't have enough air. It's not like you can take a breath, deep breath like here. There's, it's hardly any air at all. So each breath I took, I had to breathe like this. It was like Just like that. Barely could get any. So you're going to die any second from not enough air. But you keep going. So another one of these things you have to endure in hell. And um, you have to endure, the, the, like I said, the heat and the fear. You know, uh, Psalm 73, <clears throat> 18 talks about you cast them down into destruction where they're utterly consumed with terrors. And, and you are consumed with terrors. Uh, you know, lying on the floor, being helpless, I had no strength in my body. But even if I did, I couldn't have fought off that thing anyway. 
but still you feel like you'd want to have some kind of strength and you don't. You're void of all strength. And um, to give just, just a couple scriptures, I want to back up and give you a few scriptures because that's what's important to me. In um, Isaiah 24, 22, it says, They shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. So he's talking about prison cells. Uh, Proverbs 7, 27 talks about going down to hell to the chambers of death. And the word chamber means inner rooms. And uh, the bars, Jonah 2, 6 talks about the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption. And most of the commentators... Uh, the Tyndale Old Testament and the New International and, and some others believe that Jonah did experience, she went to Sheol. He was right on the outside of hell. Or some believe he was inside the gate. So there is somebody in the Bible that did experience hell, Jonah. And he said in Jonah 2.2, in hell I cried out. So he's someone that experienced hell. And <clears throat> he talks about the bars of hell. And, and Job 17.16 talks about um, <clears throat> they shall go down to the bars of the pit. And it's talking about actual metal bars. So, you know, scriptures to support that. No strength talks, is talked about in Isaiah 14, 9. talks about hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, art thou become weak as we? And the word weak is, is the same word they, uh, in Judges 16, 7 where Samson lost his strength when his hair was cut off. He became weak. And Psalms 88, 4 talks about I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Anyway, I could give you scripture for every point all the way through like this, which I love to do, but it, it just detracts from the, me telling the story. So I'll just have to make reference to a few of them. We put all of them in the book, and that's what, what I wanted to, uh, was the important thing to have in the book is the scripture. Uh, these creatures were blaspheming God. They were cursing God. And I understood what they were saying. I don't know what language it was, but I could understand them. And uh, they just were, they had a hatred for God. And they turned their attention towards me and had that same hatred for me. And I wondered, what have I done to them? But they had this extreme hatred. And so the one, that big one that you saw, picked me up and grabbed me and threw me into the wall. You know, like I weighed nothing. And I felt my bones break. And you have a body in hell. Matthew 10, 28 says, uh, Fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And there's a lot of other scriptures I could give you. But anyway, I felt the bones break. I felt pain. But the pain was masked somehow. I, I knew it was blocked, that I didn't feel all of it. And God blocked most of the pain. I, he let me feel a little bit of the pain just to be able to relate to people that you do feel pain in hell. It's not allegorical, metaphorical. It's real pain. And so I felt the bones break. I fell on the floor. And the other one with those razor sharp fins all over its body picked me up and uh, grabbed me from behind like a rag dial. And it just dug its claws into my chest and just tore open my flesh. Ripped it right open. And I looked and I, I felt the pain again and I, I noticed there was no blood or water. But, you know, there's a lot of scriptures where there's no blood in hell and no water in hell. And um, I, I noticed that I was uh, completely, uh, just, my body was destroyed. My wife and I like to work out and take care of ourselves and eat right. And... You know, it didn't matter now. body was just absolutely destroyed. But I wondered, why wasn't I dead? What's wrong with me? How come I can't die? And, but you can't. You keep surviving. Each one of these things, you survive. And I noticed that, you know, uh, you know the, the, the stench should have killed me. I, I couldn't believe how bad the smell was. I, I went to crawl out of the cell, and apparently they let me. About then it went dark. And so I believe the Lord's presence left, and it, res it resumed its normal state. Uh, because, you know, without the Lord there, it would have been dark, totally dark, and I wouldn't have been able to see anything, so I couldn't have described it to you. So when I got out of the cell, it was absolutely pitch black, like a darkness which was beyond any darkness you could imagine. And I've been in some coal mines in Arizona and so forth, where it's way down deep dark. This was different than that. It was an evil presence about the darkness, an eeriness. You know, um, <clears throat> Exodus 10.21 talks about a darkness which may be felt. You could feel the darkness, and it was evil. Uh, again, enough to terrify you, and just the fear should kill you, but you keep living. Um, I looked to the right, and I could see just a little bit, because there were flames shooting high in the sky that was about 10 miles away from me. I knew it was 10 miles away. I don't know how I knew, but again, there are certain things you know in hell. Your senses are keener. You have a little better understanding than you would here. And uh, even Erwin Lutzer, uh, one of the 
scholars of today who wrote a book, One Minute After You Die, he even said, those in Sheol have heightened perceptions and a better understanding. And he's a scholar. I don't know how he determined that, but it's true, you do. So I knew that the flames were about 10 miles away and it lit up the skyline just a little bit. Not like it would be here because it was a, a mile across. This pit of fire was one mile across. So that's a lot of fire. It would light up the whole area if it was here on Earth. But down deep in the Earth, it, the light did not travel. So I could just see barely and it was all desolate, barren wasteland. Nothing. No greenery. No, not one green thing. Uh, just rock, barren, desolate. And there's scripture for all that. Isaiah 59.10 talks about we are in desolate places as dead men. And um, so one of these creatures grabbed me and drug me back into the cell. And this one began to crush my head. And it just crushed my head flat. Now, how would I live with my head flattened? I don't know. I don't know if it resumed or what, but I felt my head get crushed. And again, I know the pain was masked. It was blocked. It would have been way worse than what I felt. But the Lord allowed me to feel some of it uh, to, to explain to people that there is pain. But uh, anyway, they, there was two more that walked into the cell. I didn't see them because it was dark, but I just knew there were two more. And they each grabbed an arm and a leg, and were going to tear my legs and arms off. And I just thought, I, I can't take this. I can't take this. And right then, something grabbed me and pulled me out of the cell and placed me over next to that pit of fire that I saw. And so I was so glad to be rescued out of that pit. For a second, I had some peace. And... Um, it was the Lord, of course, that took me out of there, but I didn't know that then. So as I was placed over by the pit of fire, then I could see uh, all the people. There were people inside the pit, uh, screaming, people burning. And I could see the outlines of people, their skeleton form. It would just look like skeletons. I didn't see, couldn't tell if there was any flesh on the people, just like skeleton forms. And they were all adult size uh, in, in skeleton forms. I didn't see that there were any small frames of people, so I, I believe there were no children there. And also, the screams were all screams of adults. You know, you could tell the difference in the kids' scream. And um, it was deafening. The screams were so loud because there's millions of people there. So, you, you know, have you ever heard one person scream? How irritating that can be, someone scream in terror? Okay, well, imagine millions and millions of people screaming in terror. <clears throat> it's terrible. And it was so deafening, I wanted to stop, but you can't get away from the screams and the sounds. And uh, I looked over and I could see other people clawing their way out, trying to get out of the cell or out of the pit. And they couldn't get out. There were demons lying all around it, shoving them back in. But they really didn't have the strength to get out anyway. They were just trying to make a feeble attempt at getting out of there. And they were being shoved back in. I didn't want to be thrown into the fire. It was hot already, but I didn't want to be thrown in the fire. That's got to be the worst thing. And there's lots of scripture on the fire in hell. Okay, now some say it's metaphorical, it's not real flames, but that's not true. It's real flames, it's real fire, just like you could imagine. I think it's even hotter than fire would be here. Everything's amplified there. But th just to give you a few scriptures, Psalms 140.10 says, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13.49 says, The angels shall, shall sever the wicked from the just and cast them into a furnace of fire. Psalm 11.6 talks about, Upon the wicked he will rain fire and brimstone and a burning tempest. So there is real fire in hell. And another reason I believe it's real fire is, you know, in Luke 16, where the rich man said, I'm tormented in this flame and send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue. Well, if it was metaphorical flames water would not suffice, right? Water, he wanted water to cool, just would help with the flames. And, and uh, in Revelation 9, 2, it talks about in the tribulation time where the bottomless pit is opened and it says the smoke of the pit ascends up and it darkened the sky and the sun became dark from the smoke of the pit. Well, if you didn't have, you had to have a real fire to have produce smoke to darken the sky. <clears throat> so it's real fire. Even uh, one of the great leaders of the past said, there is a real fire in hell, as truly as you now have a real body, a fire exactly like that which we have on the earth. That's in the book, Hell, uh, hell Under Fire, which is a really credible book written by nine scholars. And uh, anyway, so the, the fire burning these people, they were screaming. I mean, imagine burning. You know how terrible fire is. I mean, you know, look at the Twin Towers. You know, the people that were faced with the heat. Uh, people chose to jump rather than 
some of the people, right? We saw them jump. And because they said the temperature was about 2,000 degrees, that temperature, and that would incinerate them in about 15 seconds. And rather than face that 15 seconds, they chose to jump. And that's got to be horrendous to look out that tall building and jump. You've got to be pretty serious to jump out of that, you know, but rather than face the heat. And scientists say that the center of the earth is 12,000 degrees. That's what scientists say. So you can imagine the temperature you have to endure for eternity. It's just horrible. You have no purpose. Absolutely no purpose there. You're, you're, it's a useless wasting away. You have no, nothing to do. Uh, you have nothing. And Ecclesiastes 9.10 talks about no work, no device, no wisdom, no knowledge in Sheol. You're, it's just useless wasting away there. And it's a land of forgetfulness. Psalms 88.12 talks about. You have no rest in hell. Now, you need to sleep in hell. Just like you need to sleep here, you don't ever get to go to sleep. Imagine what it's like not to sleep just one or two nights. Well, you never get to sleep again. So you're kept up. And how your body would feel after just a few nights, you're, you're going to die. Well, there you never get sleep. And uh, Revelation 14.9 or 14.11 talks about, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, it's talking about the rest from the torments, but also you don't have any physical rest. You see, in Psalms 127.2, uh, God says he gives his beloved sleep. You see, so... Sleep come, he is given to the beloved, and you're not his beloved there. You see, every good and perfect gift comes from above, it says in James 1, 17. So you see, hell is absent of God's goodness. You don't get to breathe. You don't get to have fresh air. You don't get to have sunshine. You don't get any fellowship with anybody. You never get to be with people again. You're isolated from people. Even though there's people in that pit of fire, they're separated. There's no conversation. You'll never get to be with a person, never have a conversation again. All these things are blessings from God. You see, God gives all these good things that we enjoy. But when you remove God from the equation, which hell is, then there's no good thing in hell. All these things. You don't sleep. You don't eat. The smells are terrible, foul odors. And like I said, no air to breathe. And uh, Isaiah 42.5 says... He, uh, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. These people are under the earth. And that's another thing. I knew I was down deep in the earth. And uh, there's 49 scriptures that talk about where hell is right now. Okay, it's down deep in the earth. Now later, after Judgment Day, it says death and hell will be delivered up and cast into the lake of fire. But that's after Judgment Day. In Revelation 20:14 talks about. So, uh, but right now, hell is down deep in the earth. And there's a lot of scriptures for that. Remember when Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth and hell was separated by a golf fix? Uh, talked about in Luke 16. Luke, uh, Ezekiel 26, 20 talks about where hell is and number 16, 32. So many scriptures I could point out that would show you where hell is. But I understood that I was down deep in the earth about 3,700 miles deep. And somehow I knew it was 3,700 miles down. So we know that the uh, diameter is 8,000 miles, so that 4,000 is the radius, so I was close to the center of the earth. And um, I don't know how I knew that again, but I knew that's how deep it was. Like that pit of fire, it was about a mile across, and that, that's a big pit of fire. But there were individual pits of fire all, all around that big pit, where people were in their own individual pits also. There are other prison cells in hell. Some people are in prison cells, pits of fire, a lake of fire, this big huge lake of fire. And uh, so there's all different places in hell and there's all different levels of torment. And not all has the same torment or punishment. And there's a lot of scriptures of that. Uh, remember in uh, where Matthew 23, 14 talks about, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation, inferring there's a lesser damnation, or it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that city, inferring there's a less tolerable. Um, a servant beaten with many stripes or beaten with few, Hebrews 10.28 talks about how much sore punishment suppose you shall you receive. And so there's a sore punishment. Uh, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. I, there's a lot of scriptures on, on the different levels of torment, but none of them are good. Okay? All of them are bad, every single level. There isn't any nice spot in hell. So it's not a place you want to go to. Now, I, I thought about, when I was down there, I thought about my wife. And I... I thought about I could never get to her again. I'd never get out. She'd never know where I was at. She never could find me. I couldn't get out. And that thought to me was really tormenting. To live with that for eternity, that she would never know where I was and I would never get to her. 
she would never know what happened to me. That it was horrifying to me. And I've always told my wife I'd get to her no matter what happens. If we're in an earthquake and we're separated that day, I'll get to her. I'll find her. And uh, I couldn't get to her. So uh, another thing that you just have to endure there is being separated from your loved ones. I, um, I thought about people up on the earth. I understood that there was a whole world going on up here, but that the people up here don't realize there's a whole world going on down there. Most people don't realize that there's millions of people down there that used to live up here on the surface. And they're all there, tormented. And they used to live here and live their life just like you and I. Walking the earth, doing their thing, and join their families. And now they're eternally lost in this place and they'll never see their families. They'll never see anyone. I, I thought about, just for a second, I had a flashbacks of I wanted to eat a good meal, have a, a drop of water. Water was so precious. I just wanted one drop, like the rich man said. You know, one drop would have been so special. And so I really value water highly now. Uh, I, I, my wife and I both, uh, you know, I carry water everywhere we go. and I have a bar at home. I collect water from around the world. So <laughs> if you don't like water, you want to learn to love it. Because, you know, when my wife poured it for me, when we returned, she poured me a glass of water. And it just all of a sudden, it was life in a glass. See, water represents life. talks about that in Revelation 21. And um, it just was amazing for me to look at water and think, there's life in this. And see, and there's no life in hell. So there's no water in hell. Zechariah 9.11 talks about thy prisoners in the pit where there is no water. And, and, and a lot of other scriptures. But um, water is so precious now. Matter of fact, I'm going to have a drink. So... <laughs> Anyway, so, I, um, you know, I th like I said, I thought about everybody up on the earth, and there's no way to get out of this place. Absolutely no way out. You, you, you couldn't get out no matter what, but I, I could understand eternity there. Like here, you can't quite grasp eternity. You know, we think of time as having a beginning and an end, right? It's got to end somewhere. We think of time, timeline. But... Uh, in your spirit body, you can understand eternity. So I could grasp that I was going to be there forever and I would never, ever get out. So, you know, the torments are terrible that you have to endure, but the worst part is that you'll never get out. You'll suffer for eternity. And uh, I think I would like to show, before I get to the good part of meeting Jesus, I'd like you guys to see this little three-minute video we put together. Mary Kay Baxter and myself put together a little short video and her and I watched different Hollywood movies to try to find something that looked realistic about hell, something that would look real. And so it's as good as it can get for Hollywood, but it's far short of what it really was like. Uh, she saw a woman running. It was a spirit of fear chasing this woman for eternity through hell. I don't know how the woman had strength to run because I you know, didn't have any strength, but there's a lot of things I didn't see in hell. Hell's a big place, and the Lord only showed me part of it. So if she saw that, uh, you'll see the again where Kenneth Hagin's testimony where he's being drawn up to the gates and you'll see that creature that I saw. And then you will, um, you'll see people hung on crosses. And Mary Kay talked about that where people that mocked the cross that are hung on crosses for eternity. So that, that's part of what you'll see. So hopefully this will give you a little bit of a visual. It's just three minutes long and then we'll get back to the good part about Jesus. Much, much 
gives you a little bit of an idea. And, you know, you might say, oh, come on, Bill, that's Hollywood. That's real. I mean, I'm telling you, hell is a lot worse than that. And um, you, try to, you can imagine the fear that you would have living in a place like that and having no chance of escape, no strength, nothing you can do. There's no cavalry coming over to hell to rescue you. There's no angel to protect you. And, uh, and there's a lot of people out here that really want to know what the scripture says, so I just want to quote them. Uh, Matthew 25, 41, <clears throat> it talks about hell was made for the devil and his angels, not for man. Isaiah 14, 15, Ezekiel 28, 17, 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude 6, <clears throat> Revelation 12, 4 through 8 talks about demons cast down to the earth. So we know that uh, demons or fallen angels are in hell, in Sheol right now, and on the earth. And uh, there's scriptures talk about uh, Matthew 25, 41, or 24, 51 says, And he will cut him to pieces where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 18, 34 says, Deliver him to the tormentors. And the tormentors, according to Matthew Henry, he's one of the most respected commentaries, he said, um, regarding that scripture, he said, Devils, the executioners of God's wrath, will be their tormentors forever. And in Luke 12, 47, it talks about beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. And uh, Luke 12, 47, Wesley, John Wesley says, For the executioners of God's wrath are at hand. Once he has delivered you over to them, you are undone forever. And then Psalms 50, verse 22 says, You that forget God, I will tear you in pieces. Again, Matthew Henry, uh, on that scripture, he says, um, Those who will not consider the warnings of God's word will certainly be torn to pieces by the executioners. So there's people, credible people and scholars and commentaries that believe these scriptures, that's what that applies to. But um, the good thing is that none of us have to go there. You know, that's the good news. So God didn't make it for man. It says he made it for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. So that is the good news. Amen? Amen. Amen. But um, I was next to that pit, pit of fire and I was, I, something started to lift me up and I started being raised up and I was in a tunnel. It was like a cavern. And all around the edges of the cavern were uh, other demonic creatures. Some were small, you know, two and three feet tall. Some were four or five feet tall. Some six or eight feet and some 13 feet. So huge ones. Uh, there were snakes and spiders. Uh, everything that you would hate. Uh, worms and maggots. Uh, every grotesque thing is there. And they all have a knowledge of a hatred for you. For some reason they hate you. And um, they want to torment you. But the ones that were around this wall were all chained to the wall. I can't explain that, but they were all chained to the walls. I was glad that they were. They couldn't get to me. So... But, you know, like I said, they're all deformed, twisted, no symmetry at all to their bodies, and uh, grotesque, evil, there's an evil about every one of them, and maggots crawling all over the place, you know, and the, Jesus talked a lot about where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched, and he says their worm, like your own particular worms, uh, and it's interesting because, you know, if, you, if a, an animal would be dead off the side of the road, and you see it has maggots in it, this is gross, I know, but... Uh, the maggots will die when the body is consumed. You see, and that's what Jesus was saying, is where their worm dies not, because the body's never consumed. It goes on forever, and the worms eat the people forever, and the fire burns them forever, but it's never consumed, like the burning bush. Right? There's a burning bush that, with um, uh, Abraham and uh, Moses, and he went up to see the burning bush, and it wasn't consumed. So you're, you're never consumed in hell, but they keep feeding on you. Uh, it's, it's terrible. Uh, anyway, all these creatures, and I was thinking, who could fight off just one of these? I mean, nobody you know, could fight them off. I mean, look at the size of that thing. And uh, such an evilness and a hatred for man. They hated me with a, uh, it's just an incredible hatred and blaspheming God. You know, and there's a scripture in Psalms 106, 41 says, And he gave them into the hands of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Now, it's talking about God gave Israel into the hands of the heathen. And see, that curse that went on them, it's the same kind of curses that follow in hell. You're turned over to these demons, and they that hate you will rule over you. And you can't do anything about it. You know, and God's made us, man, the highest form of creation. Right? Man. And we work hard, and we uh, you know, get educated and all that. And now in hell, you're subjected to these creatures that have become the lowest form of creation. And they rule over you. I mean, how disgusting is that? I mean, this thing that has a, like a zero IQ and hates you uh, just knows torment 
and can torment you for eternity. You know, that, is that thought bad enough? I mean, look, how, how bad could it be? I mean, you can't breathe, you can't eat, you can't sleep, you, you burn, you, you're tormented, and all this you have to endure for eternity. Anyway, so as I began ascending up this tunnel, um, it was going into pitch black now because I was leaving the flames and it lit up just a little bit to see those pits of fire. And like I said, the light didn't travel very far, but enough for me to see a little. And as we went up into this dark tunnel, it got really pitch black. And I was just so afraid and knowing that I was there forever. And then all of a sudden, I mean, just all of a sudden, no warning, this bright light showed up. And it was Jesus. And uh, he showed up and just I just fell at his feet. I didn't see his face. I just saw a bright light and an outline of a man in this bright light. A super bright, pure white light. And I just fell down at his feet and all I wanted to do was worship him. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to move. I didn't want anything. I just wanted to be thankful. I, one second ago, I was lost forever and he placed it back in my mind that I was a Christian and that I didn't have to go there. You see, so, I mean, to go from one second to that to one second later being with him, it just was... Uh, it was amazing, and I can't even describe it, to be in His presence, uh, so glorious and so powerful to be with Jesus. I just laid at His feet. I don't know how long. It didn't seem like it was very long. And uh, He touched me. You know, and I said, Jesus, and He said, I am. And I already knew it was. You didn't have to wonder who it was at all. You know, some people say, oh, how do you know it wasn't a devil? Uh, <laughs> I've seen enough devils. You know, I know what they were like. His presence is so overwhelming, there's no mistaking that it's Jesus. None. He's so powerful and so peaceful and so loving and all those things I'm going to try to describe to you. But I just, like I said, I fell on his feet as a dead man. I felt like I died. And just, I, don't, I can't explain it, but remember in Revelation 1.16 where John said his countenance was bright as the sun and I fell at his feet as a dead man. That's just what happened. I felt like that. And he touched me and then I revived and I... Uh, I, I, thoughts started forming in my head. I didn't really want to ask him a question. You know, I just wanted to be thankful and grateful. But thoughts started coming to my mind. And he would answer my thoughts. I didn't really want to ask him, but he would answer my thoughts. And I thought to myself, why did he send me to this terrible place? And he said, because many people do not believe that hell exists. Some of my own people do not believe that hell is real. That statement shocked me. But since then, I've met a lot of Christians that don't believe in hell. Or they believe in annihilationism, that, you know, if we hit hell and you're annihilated, there's no hell. Uh, it's only for the devil. Or uh, they believe that eventually everybody will get out. Universalism. I mean, there's a lot of Christians that say they are they're born again, they love the Lord, and they really don't believe in hell. And it's amazing, but um, there was an article, too, in um, uh, the LA Times, June 19th of 02, which was labeled, Hold the Fire and Brimstone and where they interviewed all these pastors and they found out nobody was teaching on hell except for Ray Comfort and uh, they all said well hell's a little archaic we don't really believe that and we just know it's separation from God that's about all we know and that's what they, all these people said in the, this is in the paper you can check it out for yourself so a lot of the churches aren't teaching hell and a lot of people don't believe it so that's when he said my, even some of my own people do not believe that hell exists go and tell them it's real it exists and it's not my desire that anybody go there it's not my will for anyone to go there. Go and tell them. So I just thought to myself, yes, sir. You know, yeah, I'll go. Uh, I didn't even question it for a second, um, being in his presence like that, you know. But uh, then I thought to myself, Lord, you know, how come those demons hated me so much? And he said, because you're made in my image, and they hate me. And John 15, 18 says, they hated me before they hated you, Jesus said. So uh, they have a hatred for mankind. They hate us. And they hate God, but they can't do anything against Him, but they can hurt His cre creation. And that's what they want to do. These demons want to hurt us and torment us. And I thought, you know, Lord, I thought to myself, Lord, why did you pick me? And that's really, I shouldn't have even thought that thought because it's really arrogant of a thought. I mean, when a general would come up to you if you were in the military and said, soldier, go guard that barrack, and it's a five-star general, you wouldn't say, well, why did you pick me? You know. You wouldn't say that. That'd be, you'd just go, right? You would obey his order. Well, but I thought it. I just thought it. And he, um, he didn't really give me an answer. Uh, actually, he didn't give me any answer uh, why he picked me. So I, I can't, I really don't, 
can't imagine why he picked me. I'm the least likely, in my opinion, to go. Uh, you know, I'm a realtor. I'm not a Billy Graham or Mother Teresa. I'm not anybody famous. Um, not anybody important, to, in, so to speak. And so, you know, like I said before, I, I don't even like the summertime. So, you know, the heat bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love order and cleanliness and I'm a fanatic about all those things and hell is the antithesis. It's filthy, disgusting, stench, horrible. I mean, all of us would hate those things, but I'm like really extreme on it, okay? So, you know, for me to go there, it's like, I, it's the last, I'm the last one I would think. But the Lord said, uh, tell him I am coming very, very soon. And he repeated himself. He said, tell him I'm coming very, very soon. And he said, um, you know, go and tell them again that I don't want anybody to go to this place. And I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? Why didn't I know you? And he said, because if you would have known me, you would have had hope. And I wanted you to experience what they feel there, hopelessly lost for eternity, to never get out. You see, and that's the most important thing to experience because, you know, like I said before, the torments are terrible, but we, on life here, you can't imagine what it is to be in a hopeless situation. I mean, even the people in the concentration camps had hope that they'd die and get out of it. But you can't die. You can't get out. You'll never get out. So see, can you try to imagine that for a second, that kind of horror that to be in for eternity? It, it's beyond your mind to be able to conceive this. And that's why it's frustrating for me to try to explain to you how terrible it is there. But that's, that's why he withheld from my mind that I was a Christian. And, and again, before when I related to you that this was a... Um, this was an out-of-body experience that comes under the classification of vision. I shared with you Ezekiel and John and all those people. That's no way to associate myself with any of these great men. Okay, I'm, I'm not in any way in their league at all. It's just to show you scripture that these things can happen. Okay, it's just a vision. But um, anyway, the Lord said, the Lord, we kept ascending up above the earth's surface and we went way above the earth's surface. We came, we're still in a tunnel, even above the earth, there was still like a whirlwind around us. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was there. And we went way above till we came out of this tunnel. So at that distance, now we were way out in space. So the earth was like just a ball, you know. So I was way out in space. And I know that, again, sounds far-fetched, but, you know, the whole thing's crazy. So, but it's not. It's the truth. So, uh, and as we were out in space, you know, it was just phenomenal to see the world hung on nothing. He, it says in uh, Job 26, 7, that he hangeth earth, the earth upon nothing. It's hung on nothing. There's nothing holding it up. And you see it there. It's amazing. If all of you could see it, I'm telling you, uh, astronauts, most of them get saved that go out in space when they see all this because you just can't believe that this thing's hung there and turning so perfectly. And the Lord's allowed me for a brief moment to experience his power, uh, to feel part of his power. I, I could feel the control he has over everything. I mean, just a piece he let me feel because I saw the vastness of space and all the stars and all the planets. And, uh, and he's in control of every one of them and there's billions of them. And he has, everyone has a name for them. And he knows everything that's going on everywhere. It was just mind-boggling to feel the power he has controlling all that and watch the earth turning at a thousand miles an hour so perfectly and the, the water not spilling onto the land. I look at the ocean and think, what, what's keeping it from moving? You know, it could spill on the land just a little bit. It would wipe out a lot. But God holds the land there, holds the water in its place. And I, uh, I, I knew that he, had, he understands every thought man has. Every bird doesn't fly to, you know, fall to the ground. He knows every hair on your head. You know, all that came into my mind, rushed in my thoughts. You know, just being with him to grasp that power that he has. It's, it's unbelievable. His, he's in control of everything. There is nothing he's out of control in, okay? So, you know, we sometimes think that, you know, God maybe doesn't hear our prayer or why is he missing it? He doesn't miss anything. He is totally in control of everything. So that's what I really felt. And, and then he allowed me to feel uh, part of his love. And as I was looking, first I, had, first I looked and I, when I saw those demons and how powerful they were. And then I realized, you know, being with Jesus when we were going up that tunnel, that they looked so, when I look back at those demons, they looked like ants on the wall. When I was in his presence, they looked like an ant on the wall. And I can't explain that. I don't know if they really became that small or they just appeared that way being with Jesus. But they looked like nothing. And I thought, Lord, look at those, those things that were so big that I was so afraid of. They're nothing. And he said, all you have to do is cast them out in my name. And it was like, 
yeah, glory to God. Yeah. I, I felt so, you know, on fire. I thought, those things were tormenting me. I, th I thought, Lord, get them. Just get them, Lord. Yeah. I wanted to tear them apart. But, you know, the power, the authority he's given us over the devil. See, we don't have to be afraid of them at all when you know Jesus. But without Jesus, you're no match for them, you see. So anyway, when we were um, back, he let me look back into that tunnel and I could see people falling one after another after another back down that tunnel I just came out of. And I just looked and I thought, oh, Lord, all these people going down where I just came out of. And he allowed me to feel a piece of his heart again, his love that he has for us. And it hurt him to see those people falling into hell. It actually hurt him. And I couldn't stand to feel what he felt. He allowed me to feel it. I had to ask him to stop. I said, stop, stop, stop it, Jesus. I couldn't feel the pain that he felt. And uh, for each person that falls into hell, he weeps over. It's not his desire for anybody to go to hell. Like I said, he didn't make it for man. He made it for the devil and his angels. But man is given a choice. And we have to decide now in this life, it's too late one second after you die. And so he allowed me to feel that, that love he has. And like I said, I had to ask him to stop. But it was really glorious to feel it. I mean, how much, how much he really loves us. And when I was at his feet, you know, I just thought about for a second, boy, what if he wouldn't have gone to the cross? You know, then I, we'd all be there. But because he went to the cross, we, can, we don't have to go there. And I was just so thankful and grateful of what he did for us. And uh, amen, aren't you? Amen, thankful. But I, again, we, as we were up looking at the earth, I wanted to stay there for a while just to look at it. It was so glorious. And I believe God allowed me to see it because as a kid, I always desired to see the earth from space. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was younger. And I believe the Lord remembered that thought. He remembered that thought that I had and it was a desire in my heart. Even though it was a small thing, he took the scenic route home. Amen. So, so I could see the earth from space and he remembered that. And I think that's amazing because he said he'll give us the desires of our heart. And if he'll remember such a small thing like that, how much more will the greater things that we really have desires that are important, you know. But anyway, it was just glorious to be able to see the earth from space. And I'm so excited to have seen that. And as we came back, we came back real fast. The, the continents rushed forward real fast. We came up to California and came up to the house and... Uh, you know, just to throw in one little thought, on the way by, I even thought about when we passed through the atmosphere, I thought about, boy, we passed through that barrier. I knew the barrier those astronauts talk about where you go through that penetrate and they have to hit it at just the perfect angle or they'll burn up. You know, you've always heard about that. Well, I knew when we passed through that barrier. And I thought to myself, man, he didn't have any trouble going through that. You know? <laughs> I mean, so you think the way you do now, you know, stupid, you know. I'm sure the Lord rolled his eyes on that one. You know, but. So, just little thoughts to share with you that things you think about. I mean, your mind is still the same. You're still you, you know. And, uh, and so as we came back into, up to California, I saw my body lying on the floor. And at first, I, the Lord allowed me to feel that scripture, or that scripture, that scripture says, um, James 4.14, that life is but a vapor. Well, all of a sudden, I could see life as a, just a vapor. It was just, I actually saw a vapor go up, like above my house, a little vapor, like a tea kettle. And uh, I thought, wow, that's our life. Our hundred years or whatever we live here is that fast, it's gone. And it amazed me to see that. And I thought, wow, what we do, it, that little vapor counts for eternity. You see? And, and here we, we think that this is it. We think this is it. This life is it. And, you know, we, we want everything we want. This is so temporary. This is nothing compared to eternity. And what we do now counts for eternity. So that little, whatever the sacrifices you make now, it counts for eternity. And that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, to please the Lord. So anyway, it's hard to explain all that. But, I mean, to see your life in just a puff of smoke go up and think, man, I've got to get out there and do what the Lord's called me to do. We don't have that much time. You know, it's time is short anyway, but this time is short compared to eternity. And so he allowed me to see that. And then we came up to my body and uh, I didn't want him to go. I just did not want Jesus to go. I was like, please don't go, you know. And, uh, but I knew he was going to leave. And then somehow I entered back through my mouth or nose. I'm not sure which, but I came back into my body. I felt myself go back into my body. 
And that's right when he left, and that's when the terrors returned into my mind of hell, all the memories of hell, because you can't really live with the memories of hell, uh, the terror part. You can, the memory I have, but the terror you cannot live. And I knew instantly that my body was dying. I knew I was going to die because the terror would kill my body. I couldn't, I couldn't live. And so I could feel my body dying. And I, I just was screaming. And I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what was going on at all. I didn't know if I was back. I didn't know anything. So my wife was praying, she said, for about 20 minutes. And then I started to realize, oh, I'm back. I'm not in hell. I'm back. I'm here. And I was so grateful to be back. But I was still in all this trauma. And I, I just said, pray the Lord takes that on my mind. I'm dying. My body's dying. So she prayed. And the Lord removed it. In a second, it left. And so the terror left. So my body could keep living. Uh, because, like I said, it, you could not live with that kind of fear and terror. Uh, so God left the memory, graciously left the memory, but took away that fear. And then at that moment, I began to calm down. And, but it still took me about a year, a whole year, to settle down from this whole thing. Even with God removing that, it took about a year. Because, you know, it, I just felt frustrated. Because, you know, I know what the scripture says about hell. We believe in hell. But when you've been there and you come up to talk to somebody and they say, I don't believe in that Jesus stuff. Or I don't believe in the Bible. You just want to strangle them. You, you know? <laughs> you do. I mean, I, you want to slap them around and say, wake up. I mean, this, is your, this place is real. You're going to go there if you don't wake up. And so I was frustrated for a whole year. And Mary Kay Baxter told me that I would be. She said, you're going to be, have a frustrated until you settle down. You can't save everybody. You're going to, I wanted to witness everything that moved, you know. <laughs> and, and that's just, you know, and that's a good thing, but yet you've got to, you know, temper that a little bit. So a uh, year later, you know, calm down. So, but during that year, we began speaking at different places and so forth. But, you know, the important thing is that all of us have been, been given something to do for the Lord. We all have an assignment. So God's called me to go and tell people because His desire is not for anybody to go to this place. Not one. There's not one person in here who needs to go there. But it's your choice. And I just want to share with you a couple stories. We had so many uh, stories that, uh, experiences after this that verified that my experience. So many. I just want to share two quick ones with you. And these are in the book. But uh, one, we went, we were asked to go to a church up in uh, Sacramento. And it was a Russian church. And I spoke there. And um, it was about 5,000 people there. And this is, I just started speaking, this huge crowd of people. Anyway, it, it had to be translated in Russian. Uh, so at the end, uh, this old man shuffles up with a cane and he came up to the front and he waved, raised his cane and he said to the people, this is the man I've been telling you about. Well, I didn't know what he was talking about, but he was an elder at the church and, um, and everybody just went crazy and started clapping and screaming and everything. So afterwards we said, what was that all about? And he, that, well, it turned out that he was in World War II. He was a German or a Russian Jew and he was killed in Auschwitz. And, and I think it was Auschwitz, one of the camps. He was thrown into the ovens as a Jew and he was, an, he was a, not a Christian. Uh, anyway, he went to hell and somebody pulled him out and resuscitated him and brought him back and so he wrote a book about his experience in hell and he said, he prayed, Lord, have somebody someday come that will verify what I saw. Somebody, someday. So anyway, when he said, this is the man, that was in you know, 1944 and here he is, you know, 60 years later, his prayer was answered. So. That was really humbling for me to be an answer to this guy's prayer. I thought, wow, Lord, that's, that's incredible. But, but the important things are people that's gotten saved. We had one pastor that had sent a book to a lady, and he sent a DVD of me, or a CD of me speaking at a church. And the lady didn't know what it was, so she started playing it. Her son walked through the room at the time, and he was in his 30s. He had just gotten out of prison. He had been in prison for like 20 years. And he'd been on drugs, and, and he would never listen to anything about the Bible. And he sat down and he started listening to the CD. Well, at the end of the CD, she was amazed he was listening, but at the end of the CD, he fell on his knees and he said, I've got to get saved. And he asked the Lord to be Lord of his life. It totally blew her away that her son finally, after all these 20 years, would get saved. But anyway, six hours later, he died in his sleep. And he was going to go to church the next morning. He was all excited and said, I'm going to testify that God saved me. I'm, I'm changing my life. I'm a Christian now. He was all excited. But the drugs killed his body. He was so far gone. But the mother was so thrilled that he got saved right before he died. You see? So that's what's, that's what's important, you know, that people get saved through all this. And, you know, 
you might be here tonight and you might be saying to yourself, you know, I'm a pretty good person. So I, I don't think I'm, I'm not going to go to that place. I'm pretty good. Well, you probably are pretty good compared to yourself. But you can't compare to yourself. You see, none of us can compare to ourselves. We have to compare to God. And His standard's a lot higher than ours. His standard is perfect. So He said in His Word, if you ever lie once, He said you'll have your part in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8. If you ever commit fornication, if you have a thought towards adultery or fornication, if you even think it, that's a sin. If you steal one thing, just one thing in your life, that you, makes you a thief and you can't go to heaven. So you see, we all are blown it. We all fall far short of God's uh, goodness and His standard. You know, it's like, uh, if you compare, it's like a lady that saw the sheep on the hill and she said, you know, she looked at these white sheep and how pure and white they looked and against the green hill. They looked so pure and white. And overnight she went to bed and it snowed. She got up and looked at the sheep the next morning and they were all dingy and dull compared to the white snow. So you see, if you compare yourself with God, you don't look so good. Matter of fact, he says your righteousness is as filthy rags to him. It says in Isaiah 64, 6. And um, it even goes on to say uh, in, um, oh, where is that scripture? It talks about in Job 15, 16. How much more abominable and filthy is man who drinks iniquity like water? So that's how we look to God, filthy. But you want to make sure, if you're here tonight, that your name is in the book of life. Because I want to give you three scriptures. This is the bad news, and I want to tell you the good news. But he said in uh, Second, uh, Second Thessalonians 1 9, whoever does not obey the gospel shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. And John 3 36 says, uh, he that has the Son has everlasting life. But he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And in Revelation 20 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, that lake. Are you sure tonight that your name is written in the book of life? Because this is something you've got to be absolutely certain about, absolutely positive about. You don't even want to take one slight chance on it because you don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know you might not live till tomorrow. So you don't want to take a chance. If you don't know for sure, if there's anybody here tonight that does not know absolutely positively that their name is written in the book of life. I want you to make a bold statement and just raise your hand and say, you know, I don't know. I don't know for sure. And I don't know if I've ever really repented of my sin because Jesus said that you have to repent. You know, if you don't repent, he said, you shall all likewise perish. And uh, so if you don't know if you've ever repented and asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, if you've never asked him in your heart, I want you to do something and, and raise your hand and just say, I'm humble enough to admit, I don't know, I can't say that I've ever done that. I've never really received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've never really repented. And I don't know if my name's in the book of life. Would you raise your hand? Anybody here raise their hand and say that? Thank you for your honesty. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. I see those hands. Thank you. Praise you, Lord. You know, if, you just don't want to take a chance because I'm telling you, this place is real. Uh, you can think I'm crazy, but the scripture says it. And the place that you saw in the film, it's way worse than that. And it lasts for eternity. You know, and, and a lot of people, they'll check out if they're going to go to Europe for a trip. You'll check out the hotels. You'll do all the research. You know, to check out just for a vacation. You'll do all kinds of research. Well, you know, but hardly anybody checks out eternity. You know, and wh where you go forever. You, we need to know. So I really urge you tonight not to leave here unless you know absolutely for sure. And you can know for sure. You can raise your hand. You can come forward. We're going to pray for you in a little bit. But you can leave here with the assurance that you'll never have to go to this place and never fear any of it. Because there's no reason you have to fear it because you don't have to go there. But I want to make people aware of it so that you can see there is a real hell and, and you want to avoid it at all costs. You know, also, there's a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians that are living in a in really kind of a backslidden state. Many of us, you know, don't live the way we should live. And there's people that are saved, but they're, you know, they're living in some kind of sin. You know, and you can't be living in sin. You don't want to be living in a backslidden state where maybe you, uh, you know, you're living in a, a, you know, you're not married and you're living with your girlfriend or your boyfriend and you think that's okay and you're getting away with it. God doesn't think that's all right. You do not want to live that way. 
And, uh, you know, the scripture says in um, Romans 8.13, if you live after the flesh, you'll die. And Jesus said, if your eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than enter into hell fire. So if your eye, and the word offend means causes you to sin. So if you're doing something, if you're in the pornography, if you're, just like you said, living with your girlfriend, if you're uh, living some compromised lifestyle, you don't want to do that. He said that you're in danger of hellfire. So why would you want to take a chance and live like that? So we, I would urge you to try to get it right with the Lord tonight and commit to Him because living for Him, your life is way better anyway. He's going to bless your life. He's going to increase everything that you do and prosper you and work out everything that you have and take you to heaven in the end. Now what kind of deal? That's a good deal that God's given us. Amen.